So how's everybody doing tonight? Everybody ready to have a good evening? Yeah. All right. Uh, I want to get into, I know it's five minutes in, but um, uh, we have a very special guest tonight. Um, and and this kind of was premeditated. And I'm sure, hands up in chat if uh, or in the room here, if you were on a couple weeks ago and we were messing around with this thing here because it didn't want to update from 4 to dot .7, um, if you all remember that night, that was a that was a heck of a night that we sat here and, and messed with this uh, FPP controller with the beagle bone on it from the Culp controller. Um, so it's a fair assumption that I am not a I don't want to say not a fan of of FPP, but I have an aversion to it, and it's it's just been this very stressful thing that has um, uh, been impractical for me and there's so many people out there in the community including david there who uh use fpp and I, I hands i just show a hands in the whole community put your hand up if you use fpp if you're sitting in the room right now there's 67 of you um please go and put your hand up if you use fpp this is really important because i'd like to see uh, my guess is there's 60 plus people in here. Um, my guess is that uh, of all the people in this room, there's probably 70% that are using it. Um, so it, it, it's it's gotten incredibly stable. I have to say that uh, I haven't had one corrupted card since we switched over to version 4. But I no, I did have one corrupted card or one corrupted instance. But um, but the loading and uh, loading and so forth of FPP has always been my biggest challenge. So what my goal is tonight, uh, and thank you all for participating. Um, what my goal is tonight is to uh, to kind of take this from the the standpoint of a dummy. Uh, if you haven't used FPP before. I'm going to poorly walk through this. Uh, I poorly walked through this, I want to say about two weeks ago. And um it wasn't, it wasn't uh it wasn't the traumatic experience that I remember. And 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 the truth be told, the last time I really messed around with a lot of FPP was probably 2021 when Dan, uh, who I think is in the room tonight, Dan Culp's in the room. Um I the the last time was uh, whenever we were messing around with the uh, K-16. And that K-16 ran. It ran fine. I never had a problem with it. Um, I did have a problem with my 32. Um, but it was a matter of reflashing the card. This one was just way harder to reflash because whenever you put this in a box, it's buried. And I had to take the card out and do all kind of crazy stuff to get that button pushed down and have it powered on and get it to reset. And, um, but it, it's because of moments like that, that we all have experiences that we care not to continue to push ourselves to figure something out. And so tonight, this is the, this is the, uh, the, the case that I'm going to go through is just, if you're, if you're new to FPP, which clearly your hands are, many of you have your hands up. Um, if you're new to FPP, please, Please do not be as frustrated as I ever was. And some of you guys in the room will know just how frustrated I can get with FPP. Um, so with that being said, I want to start out with, uh, we're going to start with a Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is brand new. It's a Raspberry Pi 4. I've had this in a box for probably two, maybe three years. Uh, probably got it before the, uh, back in 2021. And um Initially, I was going to run this with 5 volt, but apparently we're not going to be able to run it with 5 volt. We're going to run it with 12 volt because, as you can see, the other celebrity uh, in the room here is David. And David has shared something with us from Experience Lights, and that's in this package. And honest to God, I still haven't opened this thing because I sent him a message like a couple minutes ago because I have no idea what all he sent or all the stuff that he did send. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't dive into it, but... There's more on this that we're going to do. So I'm going to turn over to David just for a moment and talk, have him talk about exactly what it is that's inside this package. Because like I said, I haven't opened this yet. Um, yeah, I don't actually remember what I sent you, but you were, you're talking about the Raspberry Pi that you hadn't opened. 
And it reminded me of when there was a shortage, I went on to Adafruit and tried to buy as many Raspberry Pi Zeros as I could. And uh, so short, if anybody needs a Raspberry Pi Zero, I have, I've been unpacking and I, I think I have like 40 or 50 of these things that I never actually used for anything. But um, uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I think I sent you the in and out Pi Hat. And uh, if I recall correctly, I think I also sent you some, some input triggers. Um, so really what this is meant to do it, um, you know, this actually has nothing necessarily to do with FPP. Uh, this is really just a GPIO breakout board that's mapping to GPIOs that are used, um, you know, for like pixel outputs, DMX outputs or GPIO triggers. Um, so, you know, in theory, you could use this if you're just, you know, programming something native in a bash script um, on Linux. Um, but, um, you know, most people that are, are using this are using it on a Raspberry Pi that has FPP on it. And so the idea with this is it's called the in and out, um, uh, affectionately named after, uh, the best hamburger in the United States. And you can see here, double input triggers, double pixel outputs, like the double, double hamburger. Um, but the idea here is to kind of just have an all-in-one solution for input triggers. Um, you know, this all started when I did that selfie station um, at our local art center, which ended up being really, really popular with the wings. Um, and then we created this thing called the extender node. And it was basically just an easy way to break out uh, these input triggers to somewhere far away or a distance away from your Raspberry Pi. Um, but then a lot of people were asking, well, you know, I want to have my pixel outputs and I want my input triggers and then I have to stack them on top of each other. And it was kind of janky. Um, so that's where the in and out came from was to kind of merge the input extender and um, pixel outputs and DMX output into one product. So that's the in and out Pi Hat. Uh, the purpose is to be able to easily have input triggers so you can connect things like buttons, um, you know, motion sensors, uh, remote relays, uh, brake beams, and then um, actually connect out your pixels directly to things like your wings or, you know, whatever you want to have um, interactive um, as part of your show, including DMX. So um, that is the product that you should have there, Clyde, uh, along with, I think I sent you some input triggers as well. Well, I, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil the surprise, but uh, I guess we'll, we'll do that because um, not that, not that it was a surprise anyway, I was going to let it, uh, the FPP, let's face it, is really not hard to install. It's a long process just to, the longest process is getting it set up on the SD card. You'll see that. And our goal tonight is just to, let's take this, get this running on this. Let's let's load this onto it. Then let's go ahead and get it connected up to a network, which I've got, I've got everything here. Get it all connected up to a network. And then let's plug in some, some pixel props. Now, um, the, the, the idea is, is that I want people to see that you can go um, relatively in a short time, and we're doing this live. We're not. We didn't rehearse this. We we certainly didn't sit down and make this master plan and and have bullet points and everything's choreographed out. That's for sure. But um, but I, I want you to see all of the jitters and the the little mistakes or the things that might happen because. I think the the biggest part of learning the hobby is watching other people make the mistakes and you realize, wow, um, they made that mistake. I'm going to, I might do the same thing or I might avoid it or whatever. It, it, it goes back to my original, the reason why I started doing videos in the first place. I'm an idiot and I don't want to forget and I don't want to have to ask the same question over and over again. So I would record this stuff and uh, that's what I would do is be able to go back and, and watch that recording and see how I did something. Uh, it, it just made sense. It just made sense. So um, what I'm going to do is let's go ahead and... Um, well, one other thing I forgot to mention, oh, Clyde. Go ahead. Go ahead. And, and you mentioned this in the chat, and I forgot to mention it here, is this actually can support 5 to 12 volts. Um, but if you want to actually use this to power the Pi... Uh, if you supply it 12 volts, you can bridge it, and it actually has an onboard uh, two amp uh, five volt regulator to actually provide power to the Raspberry Pi as well as your input triggers. So, 
the idea is that you have one power supply going into here, one 12 volt power supply that powers the Pi, powers your input triggers, and then also powers your pixels. So you don't have to have a bunch of different power supplies. You can just have one and it's solid. so, and, and you were saying, um, and you were saying that uh, that those input triggers, some the most of those are twelve volt. Is that correct? Little twelve volt, yeah. They'll so, work at five volt, but just you know, like for instance, the LEDs it won't be as bright. You know, mm -hmm. it, you know, you'll so, you'll drop. So, so it, that the 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 reason that we're telling you about this is because this is going to be the subject for two weeks from now. Uh, we're going to come back and we're going to revisit this. Uh, and we're not going to go from step by step at the beginning. We're going to build something very basic with some big buttons. And we're going to show you how you can, I mean, I don't have the wings here. I don't, I mean, it'd be nice to be able to get them, but um, I, I don't need the wings. We, we have plenty of, of uh, props that we can throw up and we can give uh, preset effects to and so forth and be able to utilize them for different, different uh, situations so that if you wanted to run something in your show, these buttons will work for that. But that's telegraphing it into, into next week. I don't want to I don't want to go the whole way through everything there. So what we'll do is, uh, I'm again, I'm going to poorly do this. I'm going to poorly walk us all through uh, getting started with FPP. So the first thing that I have here is I have an SD card. Um, I didn't check to see if the SD card is empty, but I'm pretty sure it is because I left it inside the box with the Raspberry Pi, which means I didn't have to go look for it. That That tells me I was kind of ready for it. So... The first thing that I'll do, let me go ahead and share my screen and then we can start the video. We can make sure the video is captured. Uh, wrong button. Number four. All right, you should, you should see a screen here. Um, the first thing that you're going to do in order to get started is uh, we're gonna go to the Falcon Christmas forums and Dan has done an amazing job of keeping these real rather organized. And uh, while I'm not going to read the instructions word for word, because I, I think at that point, it's, it, it, I, I'm just not, I, it's too too time intensive. We don't need to do that. Um, what what I uh, would say is you should read the instructions if you're first time doing it. It's not my first time. Um, but we're using version 7.5, which was released not too long ago, the beginning of July. Uh, I, I, like I said, I've already downloaded it. If you were going to download it, it's on the GitHub, but you can also download it through here. Uh, you can click on the, on the links here to select the proper image. Now there is a difference. If you have a Raspberry Pi, you definitely need the Pi version. If you have a, a BeagleBone Black, uh, then you need the Beagle version, uh, uh, of it. So uh, I happen to have both. I've already downloaded them. So these would be the links that you would go to. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, grab the next thing that we're going to need, which is a program that is called Bolina Etcher. And uh, Dan, feel free to jump in here if you want and interrupt me and tell me something that that I may not know. But uh, in as I was kind of feeling my way around this two weeks ago with with uh, trying to get it running. Uh, I went back to my old school roots, which is taking the SD card and um, you really can't see it. Maybe, uh, let's see, let me switch uh, cameras. There we go. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure maybe you can see it. I have an SD card reader right here. I'm going to go ahead and shove the SD card into the reader. And it may pick up the sound. And the first thing Windows says is you need to format this drive. And I'm going to go ahead and format the drive. And it popped up over here. And it says you can add a volume label. I Typically, I just leave this as FAT32 and uh, whatever the capacity is. Wait a second. That's wrong. Hold on a second. Hey, Clyde, we shouldn't really be using Bolina Etcher. We shouldn't? No, we've had problems with it creating uh, bad images. Raspberry Pi Imager has both images pulled in. You don't need to download anything. It's all in one shot. Um, we've seen plenty of problems lately with Bolina Etcher screwing up cards and they need to be re-imaged. Please, please don't share Bolina Etcher. I, I was going to say something similar. The Raspberry Pi Imager now has a, like the FPP released images built right in. You don't even have to download anything. It's, it's so much easier. Okay, so now we're gonna we're gonna change directions here. 
and Dan's probably <laughs> going to have to walk me through this. This card is only showing um, four gigs, and we're not going to do that. So I'm going to pull an emergency stash of SD cards that is 32 gigs, and we'll use a different new one. So we'll take that out of there. Don't know when I'll use that for, but said it was 16, but that's okay. So here's a brand new one, never used. And so you're saying all we need to do is just do exactly what we were talking about before, which is, um, uh, do we have to format it? No. No. Okay. So I have the FPP versions. There's no, any... Don't need, <laughs> don't need it. Just install Raspberry Pi Imager from the chat. Okay, so we have a chat screen. I have to go find this. Give me just a second. I don't know where that went. Chat. Do, do, do. See, this is this is why I've I've called it the exact name it needs to be, which is FPP for dummies. So apparently uh the dummy has arrived. Okay, so we have Raspberry Pi iOS or a Pi OS, I guess. Uh, download for Windows. Uh -oh. Always does that. There we go. And we'll open that up. Wherever that went. And we got a file called... Um, no, that's not here. Grab the wrong one. So we got file imager uh, right here. We'll go ahead and double click on that. And I don't know if you can see this, but it's asking me to install. I'll go ahead and click yes. And it's opening everything else up over on the other screen. And I'll install this. And we'll go ahead and finish it. So here we have uh, choose a device, choose an OS, and choose storage. So I would assume this is kind of like Bolina. Yeah. Don't don't you don't need to choose a device. It nope. filters the outputs. Just choose the OS. Choose the OS. So we're looking for um... scroll down. Scroll down. Other other purpose, other specific purpose OS. You have oh. to scroll you have to scroll down. Scroll right? down. Oh physically. Yep. Yeah. Oops. Scroll down. Other yeah. general purpose? Other specific. Nope, specific. So we'll go to other specific purpose OS. Scroll down. FPP. And we'll oh look, we're even listed on there, aren't we? Yep. And choose the first so, one. Uh, pie. So the 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 old school way where I actually have everything kind of saved is not nope. necessary anymore. Cool. Nope. So we're going to use the Pi. Obviously, that's what we're using. We're not using the BeagleBone Black version. Yep. And uh, now we'll just choose where we're going to save it, which is mounted in the F drive here on my 31.3 gigabyte hard drive. And we'll select it, and we'll go ahead and click Next. Now, um, that's fine. We're going to erase everything on there. It's a brand new card. Nothing should be on there anyway. Um, is this process still a pretty rather long process? Less than 10 minutes. He will write it and verify it. Card dependent. Well, this wasn't one of the, this wasn't the nice card. This is these are the uh the cheaper micro center cards, but they they see I mean they've held up for a couple of years since yeah. they? I've noticed different cards write faster and are better at doing this fair enough stands to reason too i mean if you have a better card that has faster whatever in it you know so david i guess i can open this up since everybody's sitting waiting this is why i didn't want to uh, i only want to do this um this long form version one time uh, because it does take a long time to get it rolling on there. I mean, well, we're 28% in. But like I said, didn't even open it yet. And I imagine the in and out part is uh, called in and out because um, you have a second header here, goes in and then back out. Is that the reason, David? 
<laughs> it's because it has input triggers as well as the outputs like pixels. So it has both of those. Um, you should have also received though the extender node and the buttons as well. Just wanted to confirm that, right? That is correct. I okay, did. okay, just wanted to make sure. Yeah, so um, what you'll notice on there is, yeah, you have the, the six local input triggers and then there's an RJ45 on there. So if you wanted to connect an additional six input triggers using the extender node, for instance, you know, the use case would be, you know, your pies in your garage, but maybe your, you know, your selfie station is out in your driveway. You can just run a cat five cable and still get those six input triggers um, from the buttons without having to um, bring your raspberry Pi out into the, into the driveway. So it's just a, a way to bring those terminals, those screw terminals closer to the actual buttons themselves. So this is one. So are you saying that the network side, this is one through six and this is seven through 12 that's on board? Correct. Correct. We were, we were surfing around last week, uh, two weeks ago, last week, I'm, I'm losing track now, but, um, we were surfing around trying to find out the exact, uh, way that those needed to be, uh, routed in, out, up, down something. I don't remember. Um, Rob was Rob was spearheading that side, and I checked out because I was trying to sequence. But um, but they were asking it was, somebody was asking about how the triggers work. So this this I feel like um, I feel like this is going to be a, a rather fun project. I could go ahead and start assembling this, couldn't I? Yeah, yeah. So, so the thing about the the input triggers is is super super simple. Um, for every input trigger, there's two contacts. Um, so by default, they're floating. And then when they are connected to each other, that is the contact being made um, for the input trigger. So, um, you know, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but you, you basically say hey, when this is, um, when the GPIO that's listed goes high, then you do something, play a sequence or um, play an effect or run a custom FPP script. So really what you could do is if you say you didn't have a button or anything like that, if you just took a safety pin or a piece of jumper wire and you just connected those two terminals with a piece of wire, um, that would trigger the input as well. Looks like you're already verifying. So that was really fast. That was uh, way less painless than it was, let's say, back in 2017, Dan. Good job. Way to go, man. The speed this is going seems to feel um, medium to me. So some cards obviously will write faster and some will write slower. But um, this is a good speed. Good sounds, like, sounds like uh, I got Mama Bear's bowl of porridge then. Right in the middle. It's just there you go. <laughs> the, the other thing to keep in mind is it downloaded it during that process too. So there was oh. some... I mean, it, it wasn't like you missed that whole step that you, that you didn't have to do before of, of downloading it. So also a good thing. No, that's that's definitely a great point because the simplicity is it's one less, it's one less, yeah, you have you have Raspberry Pi Imager on your, um, on your computer. Once it's downloaded, it's downloaded, but you open it up and it takes care of the download part. So you don't have to be like me and be a file hoarder to uh, hold on to old versions because uh, it'll just download directly from the, um, and that's obviously because you you guys spent time working it out so that you could have it included in here. So there, it, it looks like it's done. FPP version 7.5 has been written to the card. Now you can remove the, uh, remove the SD card, which we'll do from the reader. And we'll go ahead and hit continue. And we'll take the card out and we'll go ahead and place it hopefully correctly in there. So someone just mentioned, uh, Don said, is there a debound circuit on the in and out board? The, the, the in and out board doesn't have any logic built into it. So no, there's no debounce built in, but FPP has that function. So now we need to find our power in and out. And, uh, Sorry, just there was one other question here, um, Clyde, if you don't mind. Sure, uh, go ahead. He, he asked if the resistors are already on the in and out board. Yeah, so it's it's actually, um, there, there's a buffer chip in there as well. So 
it's fully isolated. Um, uh, those those input triggers are actually, um, you know, if you supply 12 volts in, it's actually a 12 volt input trigger. So um, obviously the the GPIOs on the Pi are um, three 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 point three volts. So um, there's a buffer chip in in between there. So it's all safe to to pump in, you know, five volt input triggers or 12 volt input triggers. So I am going to add power. It looks like, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong by all means, because again, I don't want to see any uh, blue smoke come out. That would be not so good. Um, ground is here. It's on the white, white line. And then uh, the hot is on this side here uh, with where it says 512 volt in. And do we need to change this jumper? It says provide power to Pi 12 volt only. Yeah, so if you are wanting to use the function where there's the onboard, onboard power supply, mm -hmm. then you supply 12 volts, meaning it will then be routed through the power supply on the board, which will buck that 12 volts down to five volts, two amp power supply to power the Pi. If you don't want to power the Pi from the Pi hat, you can do so separately by whatever means you would like, but then you would just remove that that uh, um, the jumper, the jumper shunt. Yeah. So you would you would just take that jumper off, disconnect the two lines. You could leave the jumper there, but you'd want to make sure that those two pins are not connected any longer. Correct. Now it it actually won't hurt anything technically. So you know what 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 happens is if you have two power supplies powering the same thing, um, you know, and just for people on the the line when you're wondering why don't you tie your positives together, it actually won't, it's not going to necessarily break anything, but you're not going to get double the power. Um, typically what happens is one power supply takes all of the current and the other one takes none or or most. So, um, you know, when you have two power supplies hooked up, you could have one on one side and one on the other. It will still work, but only one is really doing the majority of the, of the current supply. Okay. Well, it looks like the moment of truth is here. We've got... Um... I'm pretty sure you can see this. We've got everything hooked up. I just need to find my power cord. We don't need the SD card reader anymore. This is the power supply line. Raspberry Pi box out of the way so I don't hit anything else. We're going to need the screwdriver for a little bit, but not for a moment. And I'll go ahead and shut that off. We'll plug this in, and now we'll switch it on positive to positive ground to ground. And uh, we should be looking to see when we turn this on, if we get a couple lights blinking here. So looks like we did. You can so see- So we're currently focused on your laptop screen. I don't know if you want to focus on your camera. That's, a, that's a good point. And we will pin. So the other thing that we need to do is we need to plug in the network, don't we? Now this goes right to my uh, router. Probably should have done that whenever I first plugged it in, but um, that's basically that's basically all there is to it now. Um, uh, over here, I got my laptop or my um, my keyboard and my mouse, and what I'll do. And I guess it doesn't help that I stopped sharing. I guess I need to um, share the screen again. Let me go back here. And I do know that we should be able to easily type in here on on just our our. Uh, 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 just into our browser, fpp.local. And you can see that I've done that a handful of times before. It automatically popped up before. Uh, Ron's suggesting that it might be a good idea to reboot that now that I attached the network. We'll try first and see. And if it doesn't come up, then we'll definitely know that we have to reboot it, right? Right. And if the Pi boots up with no network attached, it may go into like tethering mode. But it looks like it got an IP, so you're good. So it gave it, and I'm going to write this. Well, it, it, so this is what's this this is what's absolutely phenomenal about the modern version of FPP. And my hat goes off to Dan. Is up here at the top. It tells you 
because you are connected to the network and it's the only FPP instance that's connected on the network period um, that it tells you what the IP address is right here. So uh, there's there's really no more need to worry about remembering what the IP addresses are, uh, especially if you only have the one hooked up. Uh, but this is step number one. I guess we have a couple steps that we need to go through here um, before we can finish the setup. And I think the first thing that we need to do is we need to go in here and choose some options. And that would be for enable UI password. Uh, I'm going to disable this because th this is going to be a, 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 a little um, plaything for me to mess around with and get better acquainted with. Uh, there's an OS password. I'm going to use default. And then let's see, we have. Uh, hey, can I just mention something real quick about those? By two all things? means, Dan. Uh, no, I. There's so, some people that are complaining about we we have has having those things there because it's like nobody ever really sets them and it's kind of like a false sense of security thing and all that stuff. Um, but there are certain laws like California has one. Uh, there's a couple of the European nations that any devices that ship, uh, like Internet of Things, have to be able to set passwords when you first log like first log into them so that's kind of why they're there so yeah so, yeah they're it's not like super secure and and everybody pretty much knows what the default passwords are anyway but it is what it is they're, so they're, are you are you saying that um if you were packaging this up and sending it to somebody in one of those states that they yeah, well, that like for, for, for me I, sh I sh like if you purchase a controller from me with a beagle installed already on it i mean out of the box you pull it out, plug it in, it's got FPP up and running. I mean, it, by law, you're supposed to have it asking for passwords and stuff. It's it's just, I mean, gotcha. I'm assuming a lot, like a lot of the, the IOT people probably ignore some of the, or don't even know about some of those weird laws, but uh, it is what it is. I and mean, it's, they, they exist and they're annoying, but it is, I, I wouldn't count on those settings being super secure. So just because you set a UI password, I would not, then open port 80 to, to your FPP since to the internet. It, it, <laughs> it, it I just wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fun fact at Expo or Trans World is uh, just, you know, hopping onto other people's FPP and just messing with their display. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, this is why I left California. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. So um, moving on from here, I, if I remember correctly, it would, it prompted me to have a to make a change to 8.8.8.8 or 1.1.1.1 is that still applicable for i don't know what that was i don't remember what it was it's not prompting me now uh i do know that we need to change this from europe to uh you don't have to just oh, choose oh look, look at that look up location look, yeah location and location. Then we should update the locale to US with you based on time. Zone. Yeah. So those are the, the those are the four major updates. And now it's asking us to uh, restart FPPD or do we want to finish that up first? Finish that up first. What's this banner? Uh, we There are stats that we collect. Um, it's obviously an opt-in thing. Um, That'll show up here, though, after we restart, though. Yeah, yeah. It, it, but, it, like, enable or disable there, depending on what your preference is. Mm -hmm. So we'll go ahead and enable it. Um, and we can finish setup, and then we can start restart up PPD. We do not need to save that. Um, and this is where we have to expand our file storage because we have something larger than uh, a standard size SD card at like four gigabytes or something. So we'll, is it better to do that or should we restart a PPD? I, I would just expand and then reboot. It's just easier. <laughs> All right, we'll go into that. We'll grow the file system. And that, well, the, the the banner at the top now says reboot. So,
All right. So uh, we used. Did you hear me say discover? No, but thanks for the. Okay. It. Well, you you marked it. You marked it, and I was saying, yeah. As as Alex was pointing at discover, I'll have to edit that in the video. But uh, in any event, discover is awesome. Uh, David, um, it it didn't automatically discover that this was your was your um, was your uh, Pi hat. Is that something that you're able to set up in the firmware that's on the hat? No, so the so the the uh, the in and out Pi Hat is is not a anything. It's not a controller. It's not anything that would communicate with X lights. Okay. So any configuration you would be doing with the in and out Pi Hat, for instance, with input triggers, would be in the FPP interface directly. Okay. So when we bring it into X lights, though, we need to bring it in using uh, your under experience lights. It won't auto import that 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 it's an experience lights. Hat. No, no, this would be um, just uh, FPP, I believe. Um, yep, as yep. The... FPP, yep. So there is there is no setup for this. No, because this isn't the the Pi Hat is not a controller. It, it's literally just a GPIO okay. breakout. Yeah. So okay. so the vendor is is FPP, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Vendor FPP. And then if you want to use the pixel outputs, you would specify Pi Hat. So we would go and here. Model, and Pi Hat. that would be it. So if we were using this, and that, that was the goal. That, that's what I wanted to accomplish. The basics, the bare necessities of getting this going would be if you were going to use your board as a Pi Hat, um, this is the steps that you would go through. And okay. th then when we expand on this in the future, we'll, we'll go into more standalone mode kind of thing. But uh, the next thing that we need to do is we need to put some, uh, we need to put some, where did my screwdriver go? A quick comment, if you don't mind. Sure, go um, ahead. So if this is going to be a player or an FPP remote, um, as far as controlling the pixel outputs, on the right-hand side, the active setting, you're going to want to set that to X bytes only. On the right-hand side of this controller page where it says active, active, Active would be if you are sending live E131 or DDP data to the device. If it's going to be an FPP player or an FPP remote, you want that set to X lights only. Hopefully that makes sense. So um, Ron, for stupid people like me or dummies, I should say, like me, um, can you elaborate on what X lights only means? Yeah, so X lights only means that when you do an FPP connect and upload, you have the option of configuring your FPP player to output live pixel data, such as on DDP or E131 to your standard controllers, like Genius controllers, Falcon controllers, et cetera. If you're FPP or running as an FPP remote and you're using the multi-sync protocol, you're not using those live streamed protocols. So if you're using the, either as a player or as a remote using multi-sync, you want X sites only, which means when you do your FPP connect, it will not configure an output to send data to itself. You may get a warning message in FPP saying that you're sending data to yourself. And if that's the case, that's likely because that setting is set to active instead of X sites only. That is very helpful. Thank you. Okay. So in this instance, we have uh, output number one, which you can see here, and output number two, which is here. Uh, there are no fuses on this board, are there, David? False. There are fuses. Um, so what you'll notice on two, both outputs, there's a little LED there that's indicating that the um, there's there's poly fuses. Uh, yeah, under the board you'll see them. They're little three amp um, poly fuses, meaning they're automatically resettable. Um, so when that uh, polyfuse is tripped, um, you know, to reset it, you have to remove the pigtail and then reattach it to reset it. Um, basically, once the load is removed, it resets itself automatically. But that little LED will turn on, or excuse me, turn off when it's tripped. All right. So if, if we've done everything correctly, um, no. You know what I want to do is I want to import this from a layout import from there we go um it'll take me a second to find this all right 
So what I'm doing right now is I'm using the function in XLights that allows me to import models from other layouts. Um, I'm going to go ahead and grab, uh, I think it says it under candy, is it candy cane? We really don't need those. We need, um, oh, there we go. Candy cane one and candy cane three. Oh. Because right behind me are two candy canes and I'll go ahead and unlock them. I will grow them so you can see them. Resize, match size, align. There we go. And I'm going to actually should just move them this way. There we go. Because behind me, that I think that's the way that they're set up behind me. I think so. We'll figure it out. Um, so now we have a couple models. Uh, we'll go ahead and save our layout. Not that that matters too much. Um, and then we'll go back over here to the uh, to the pie, and we'll double click on the controller and it'll bring up and it'll show us we have two candy canes and we have two ports that we can attach these to uh candy cane one and candy cane two well it says three but that's okay now we have a extension port that goes over to this candy cane over here which i don't know if you can see this one as well i'll uh, switch the cameras here in a second but uh, we'll put the left one on this. And we'll put the right one right here onto this. So you can't see. So I'm going to switch cameras. And you should be able to see a little bit of them behind me here whenever I switch cameras. This is basically all you need to see of the pie um, for now. And you should see my beautiful face. And you should see at least one candy cane here. Can you let me know if you can see the other one? Maybe I can bring it up here. Can you see this one? You're, you're focused on your uh, your screen again, your computer screen. Right, but you, can you see can you see the camera uh, the camera on me? Yes, off off the side, just smaller. Right. We just need to see that they're working. That's all. So now that we've got these attached here. Um, I believe we go in and we need to upload these models to FPP so FPP knows what it's attached to, right? Or what it's outputting data to. Is that correct? We'll go FPP connect under tools. Going to discover FPP instances, which came up over here. I'm going to um, make sure that the models are selected. And we put a checkbox into the pie hat. And hopefully, if we upload this, that should now come over here. And if we go in and we look at our input output settings, and we look at our channel outputs. There's, I think you want to click on pixel strings. In Go to pixel strings and correct F P six and seven and everything newer than six. You have to define an EEPROM either in hardware, which this device does not have, or a virtual EEPROM to define the cape type. So install virtual EEPROM and then pick Pi Hat. Perfect. So that there are other choices there if you wanted to do different hat types. Um, some of the RPI stuff, some of the Hanson hats, but this will be just a generic Pi hat. So choose Pi hat and, and install. All and right. Finish, quote. please reboot. And that will actually define what output types are available for a generic Pi hat. So since the in and out board, like David described, doesn't have any other controller functionality, it functions in this regard as a generic Pi hat. And, and David, if if you do a new version of this board, just put the thirty cent EEPROM on there, and it would handle that automatically. Good to know. I did not know that. <laughs> I may reach out to you separately on that one. 
Well, I think it's simplicity in, well, again, this all goes back to being a dummy and uh, I certainly am playing the part right now. So, oh, is it yeah. still rebooting? It possibly is. So, possibly. Um, like, so like in all of Dan's boards and a lot of other FPP based controller boards with that hardware EEPROM, it's programmed already. So you don't have to worry about that virtual EEPROM stuff. So give this just a second. It should start up here shortly. It, it, that, and to go back to the discovery question too, is is if there was the EEPROM on the board that described the fact that this was experience lights in and out board or whatever, discovery could pick that up as well and, and pre-populate a whole bunch of things as well. So the, the, the fact that there's not an EEPROM on the board uh, just limits what can be detected automatically. Um, and, and like I said, it, if you do another version, just having the EEPROM just makes things a lot easier. You can have actually some of the GPIO triggers have defaults and stuff. So there, there's all kinds of things that it would open up. The um... So back in the day, this is uh, one of the pie hats that um, that I worked with. Uh, well, I didn't do it, but um, uh, Andy Harrison and uh, Daryl Pellegrin worked on. This is the Stooges pie hat. It was like the first rendition of trying to make a simple connection. And uh, I never used them. I never really used them. Um, but that's one of the things that I wanted to try was see, well, what can I do with it? But uh, in any event, um, whenever you click, uh, whenever you click the discover, if it has that EEPROM, that's what you're saying. That's what it needs in order to understand what it is. So uh, again, if we go back to the, the channel outputs, the input outputs, you go to channel outputs. Uh, I remember having to manually go in and set up the enable pie hat here. Uh, I remember uh, making sure that, oh, here's my two props. Um, it's brought in the pixel count. It's given them the start channel according to X lights where they should be. Uh, so we should be able to um, do a basic output the lights with these. And what I'll do is I'll create a new sequence animation done. And I'll put a timing mark down. And the, this is something else that I find really interesting about FPP now is, is that whenever you hit the output to lights, one of the first thing that happens is that FPP now goes and automatically uploads any changes to any active version of FPP that is on the network that is associated with that, with that layout. Is that correct, Dan? Uh, it's a setting in the controller on the controllers tab. So it, it may or may not, depending on what you have it set there as um the auto uh, upload uh, auto, auto upload, upload models and so auto upload configuration yeah, yeah. so that's, that's, that's it's turned off right now so you'd have to manually hit the upload button but that's okay so let's go ahead and put a uh spiral effect on the candy canes here one of these might be going hopefully it is it's not FPP is not so, turned on. FPP is not turned on to receive live data yet. So that so would back be back FPP, over here. Input output channel inputs. Check enable, save, restart. And look at that as soon so, as I did that. By default out of the box, FPP is set to not receive live data like you're sending from X sites. So that's to prevent if FPP is your player, it would prevent you accidentally leaving like your output to lights and X sites on and interrupting your show. So it's there by design. If you had done upload outputs on the controller tab to upload the outputs, it would also have uploaded the inputs and it would have enabled that automatically for you. So that is the first one, and we'll copy and paste that onto the one behind me. And it looks like everything's working good. So there are a ton of options. And as you can see, FPP has changed even directly since I've used it last time. It's it's a little bit of it was a, a little bit of a feel through whenever I was messing around with it a couple of weeks ago. But um thank you guys for the specifics. Um it is definitely much easier than it used to be. Uh, I know this. I knew this was going to take long enough, and this is one of the reasons why I didn't want to do um, everything all in one long shot. So 
Uh, huge thank you, Dan. I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Uh, David, um, this board next week is going to do some pretty crazy thing. Uh, not next week, but the next time we get together on Tuesday for a webinar, it's going to do some pretty crazy things. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. We'll walk through, um, you know, just basically how to set up input triggers in FPP, uh, how you can do things with effects and sequences, um, different types of input triggers that you can use um, with with the with the different uh, pie hats. Uh, so hopefully, if you guys like the video, I hope you like it. Give us a thumbs up. Um, if you haven't done yet, so subscribe to the PPD YouTube channel. If you haven't gotten into the group yet, uh, we're uh, on Facebook. We have a Facebook group, uh, Pixel Pro University uh, on Facebook. And you're welcome to certainly join us over there as well. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us, info at pixelprodisplays.com. Uh, if you have suggestions for what you'd like to see with, uh, you know, FPP or some of the other crazy things out there for FPP, um, I'm going to be doing a little bit of content over the next few weeks with just FPP. So put your suggestions in the comments. Uh, I would definitely like to hear it. Um, I'm going to uh, end the meeting or not end the meeting. I'm going to end the video here. So guys, if you're out there, thank you for joining us. It's been wonderful having you. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Take care and goodbye for now.